brothers and sisters, today's lectionary passage is about uh, testifying to the light. I think I've mentioned to you, it probably falls into the category of whining more than anything else, about uh, the lectionary passages during this Advent. Do you remember the first week was Mark 13? That's the little apocalypse. That's a great way to start uh, Advent. And then uh, last week was uh, the beginning of Mark's Gospel. You know, the, the gospel that has no birth narrative about Jesus in it at all, while everybody's thinking about the coming of Christmas. And then this week is John's version of the passage from last week. If you were here last week, we talked about people quoting the prophet Isaiah and what that looks like in the Old Testament and baptism and all of that sort of stuff. And now we have the same story just told by a different person. So they're really trying to make it as difficult as possible, I think, to, to, for preachers. So you've got to keep on your toes during this particular Advent to, to catch up with these passages. So, and of course, we don't have much time left. Advent is, is nearly done, and then it will be Christmas. And Christmas lasts how long? Thank you. Very good. It's not just one day, right? It's 12 days. It's a season Christmas. So Christmas season is coming, and it will start a, a week from today, after we've had the fourth Sunday of Advent in the morning, we'll have Christmas Eve in the evening. We'll have to do both things on one day. So that's interesting. Last week, when we heard Mark's account, um, the very beginning of Mark's Gospel, and uh, I shared with some of you when I, when I very first read that, I read the first few verses of Mark's Gospel, and, uh, and thought to myself, there's nobody in this passage is going to live through this. Because the passage is so absolutely outrageous in the things that it says. Might not sound like it today, but it was then. And, um, and what Mark does is, is put forward really two incredibly challenging questions to the people gathered uh, around John, the questions he, and the text he puts on John's lips. The questions are, does the good news begin uh, with Jesus or with the birth of Caesar? This is from comparing the first verse of Mark's Gospel with what's called the Prine Inscription, which is an inscription above a city gate in Greece. And then, is Jesus the Son of God or is Augustus the Son of God? Because it says Augustus is the Son of God on the coins that the people used. So Mark's answer to both of these questions is Jesus. That's why nobody lived through this experience here, because it was a direct challenge to the Roman Empire. It was a choice between empire and kingdom, which is a subject we've seen over and over again in the Gospels. Mark taught that preparatory to the coming of Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, uh, there's a process of confession, repentance, and forgiveness that he advocates all before the coming of Jesus. And so we looked at those in terms of the message that's delivered about the kingdom, and we concluded that it probably looks something like this. We ask ourselves the question, have we loved God with all that we are and all that we have? And if the answer to that is, well, not all the time, that's a confession, that counts. Have we loved others as much as we love ourselves? And if the answer to this is, well, not on my bad days. That's a confession too. And then repentance would be about turning away from the empire towards the kingdom, and that you can do in all sorts of ways during uh, the time leading up to Christmas. And then forgiveness, perhaps the most difficult part, knowing that at your core identity, you are a beloved child of God. No matter what others might see in you or what you might see in yourself, your core identity is that you're created in the image of God. And that can lead you to forgive even yourself for things that you may have done at some stage in your life. So forgiveness is the tough one, I think. The others are pretty simple. Confession, repentance, forgiveness, difficult. So we looked at that a little bit here. And now today we have John's version of the same story. Now, John likes to talk about light and darkness. It's like it's his favorite thing in his gospel, light and darkness. And he talks about light coming into a dark world. And it was a dark world for the people of Israel, living under foreign occupation by the Romans. Their temple structure and temple leadership appeared to be uh, working in collusion with Rome. And so for the ordinary people, it was a pretty dark time. 
and we're told that there's a man sent from God whose name is John. This isn't the John who wrote the gospel, of course. This is now John the Baptist. And that this John the Baptist guy, this John, is going to come as a witness to testify to the light, even though he isn't the light himself. And then the light is going to come into the world, and that light later is identified as uh, the person of Jesus. So, now John's emphasis in this is about challenging the temple authorities. If you read this a little bit carefully, you'll see, remember now, Mark was challenging Rome. Rome and the temple authorities are colluding with each other. And John comes out and challenges the people from the temple. So the Jews, which is a very strange expression that John uses it's got nothing to do with a broad identification of Jewish people. It's to do specifically with people that come from the temple. The Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem from the temple. And later we're told that they had been sent from the Pharisees. And these are the people who've come out to challenge John the Baptist here. And so John the Baptist takes them on in a little debate. Uh, the big question they ask is, of course, who are you? And th they don't really want to know who he is. They want to know what authority has he got to be doing the things that he's doing, this baptizing people in the river. Who are you that you should be doing that? And they have this little exchange here. John just comes right out and says, well, I'm not the Messiah. And they say, well, are you Elijah? We talked about that last week, the Elijah issue. He says, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? Probably a reference to Isaiah. He says, no. So they again say, who are you? And he describes himself using the words of Isaiah then that he is the voice of one crying out in the wilderness make straight the way of the Lord. We looked at that from Isaiah's uh, book last week and we talked about how people actually did that. They made straight the way in the wilderness when the emperor came on a journey. The Lord came when the emperor came and they would knock down the hills, they'd fill in the valleys, they'd straighten the road so he didn't get jiggled around in his carriage when he was going through on a trip somewhere. They literally did that. So this is, this is a real thing. And the gospel uh, writer identifies that this is, uh, this is from the book of Isaiah. Although we looked at the punctuation of it and it's a bit dodgy. So... Now, the priests and the Levites make clear that what they're interested in is not who are you in the sense of tell me your name and address, but who are you, what authority do you have to be baptizing people? And so they ask him, why then are you baptizing if you're neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? The implication that John is really a nobody and he has no business going around baptizing people. In fact, his response though I think probably put them on edge because he says, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. In other words, if you don't like what I'm up to, just wait till this guy who's coming shows up. You're really going to be unhappy about that. And of course they are when Jesus shows up. They're really unhappy about that. And the passage ends with this took place in Bethany across the Jordan. So Bethany across the Jordan is the name of a place. It's not just Bethany, which happens to be across the Jordan. Bethany across the Jordan is a place where John was baptizing. And um, I think it's probably significant that it's happening there because the last time uh, somebody came across the Jordan whose name uh, was Yeshua, this would be Joshua from the... Old Testament book Joshua he came across the Jordan right right there and attacked Jericho if you remember and then he attacks AI and these other cities one after another so uh, his name means the one who saves Yeshua and that's Jesus's name in his own language so I'm pretty sure they would have had this image in their head, uh oh, he said somebody's coming and we're right in the place where the one who saved showed up in history, came across the river and there was all sorts of trouble. So it's really a kind of warning rolled into the name of the town and the location close to Jericho on the other side of the Jordan, I think. So having said all of that, and Jesus is coming, the challenge is not just directly to Rome, which is what Mark talks about, but to people who collaborate with Rome, religious individuals who collaborate with the empire. So, 
that's worth thinking about in terms of life in the world today. Uh, religious groups who collaborate with the empire, what would those look like today? Uh, how would they function? And in um, the time of John the Baptist and Jesus, they were talking about priests and Levites from Jerusalem, from the temple, including the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were... There, there are lots one could say about the Pharisees, but one of the things um, we can say with some certainty is that they took their book of rules very seriously. They liked to have rules that you should follow. They really did. So what we have is a religious group who likes rules and is collaborating with the empire. So you can translate that into what's going on in the world today and figure that one out. You don't need me to do it for you. And into that comes uh, Jesus, who is described as uh, the light. The light is about to show up. Now, John's gospel has so much to say about light, it would take a really long time to go through every reference to it. At the very start of the gospel, we're told that what comes into being in the world, in the universe, in him, the him being a reference to the word, is life. And the life was the light of all people. It's one of those sentences, it sounds really nice until you stop and think about it. And then you think, How, what, what, what does it actually mean here? And then um, John says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. And still in the same chapter, chapter one, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. What you actually have, if, if you stop and think about this for a minute, the book starts with, in the beginning was the word. And this word is related, is the Greek, the logos, the structure of the universe, if you like. And that's related to life. And remember, we've talked about this issue before, that there are different Greek words you can use for life. One of them, for example, is bios, from which we get the word biology. And bios is the difference between, say, a rock and a bunny rabbit. A bunny rabbit has bios and a rock doesn't. The bunny rabbit is alive and the rock isn't, right? That's not the word that's used. The word that's used for life is zoe. If you know anybody who's named Zoe, this is, this is why they're named that. Um, and zoe is, is life in a different sense. It's, it's the type of life that I think in English one would write life with an exclamation point after it. Or life the way it could be. Life that was lived to its fullest. Uh, sometimes the term abundant life is used. It's that that we're talking about here. And that those two things together generate the light of all people. And then Jesus comes along, and Jesus is described as the word made flesh. In other words, given Zoe. So if you take word and Zoe and put them together, what do you get? You get Jesus. And Jesus is the light of all people. Jesus is literally the Logos alive, walking around, the word in a body, right? The word incarnate here. And so I think this is the point that uh, John is trying to get across here in his gospel, is that one of the ways of thinking about uh, Jesus, he's had a lot longer to think about Jesus than Mark did, because he doesn't write this book for a lot of years. And so there's been a lot of reflection. Well, who is this guy, this Jesus? And so they've taken the idea of the Logos, which is a sort of Greek philosophical idea to do with what holds the structure and function of the universe together, and said, what would happen if you gave that life, put it into a body, made it walk around? Well, you get something then that is a light for all people. That's who Jesus is supposed to be. So it's that light that's coming into the world at Christmas when there's a nativity and Jesus is born in the form of a baby. This is what's happening here. So when uh, John goes on and continues to talk about light, by the time you get to the third chapter, I know this is a little bit long, but it's worth reading. John says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Now, if you read that out and you kind of try and map out then 
Well, what are these characteristics of light and darkness that John is talking about here? And what you'll discover is that light is the thing that's associated with life, which means that darkness would be associated with its opposite, which is death. Darkness, we're told in the passage, is associated with evil deeds, which means light would be associated with the opposite, which are good deeds. And in the passage, we're told that light is associated with truth, which means darkness would be associated with falsehood. And so you wind up with a list of characteristics here, and lo and behold, they turn out to be the same characteristics that we've talked about for the kingdom and for the empire. These are the markers of those two terms that we've talked about over many, many weeks here. So the subject is the same, it's just that John's using different vocabulary to talk about it here. Um, By the time you get to the 8th and ninth chapters, we have uh, John reporting the words of Jesus, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, if you never walk in darkness, it means you never get sucked into the empire. Uh, You'll have light, the light meaning the kingdom, and it's the light of life. And so that's associated with this abundant life, not just the type of biological life that every living thing has, but this special type of fullness of life that becomes possible. And in uh, John 9, he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. There's a very famous passage, of course, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And one can, um, many people have written lots and lots of books on this. There in uh, John, a whole bunch of passages that say, I am something from from the lips of Jesus. I'm the light of the world. I'm a gate. I'm all sorts of things. Uh, I am in in Hebrew is the name of God, right? When Moses comes to the burning bush and says, what's going on? The voice comes out and says, I am or I am who I am, depending on how you want to put it into English here. And so through a series of little maneuvers, you can get from this Greek expression, ego a me, to uh, I am. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, if you put a comma in it in English, I am, comma, the light of the world, it becomes that God is the light of the world, and that this is the God that generates the logos, that comes alive with Zoe in the person of Jesus. It's kind of a statement about the nature of God and the nature of Jesus all rolled into one here. So the connection is between word or logos, life and zoe, and light here. It's an important idea, I think, because when I think about what happens at Christmas and I think about what the world looks like, it's pretty easy to get sort of depressed about the state of the world and see things as very dark. And in many places they are very dark. You know, maybe they're not particularly, maybe they are for you, but, you know, maybe not. Maybe you're in a good space here, but you don't have to look very far around the world to see a lot of darkness. And so Christmas for me is about light coming into the world. And uh, the light is important because, you know, darkness is not the opposite of light. As you know, it's simply the absence of it. If there, if there isn't any light, then it's dark. And when the light comes in, it dispels the darkness. And so this message of the light coming in, dispelling the darkness, calling us towards the kingdom and away from the empire, whether we're in part of a religious group saying don't collude with the empire, whether we're part of a, a political system, whatever it is, the call is to move towards the kingdom to be the light that comes into the world. That's why Christmas matters. Christmas is important. In John's Gospel, the last mention of light is in the 12th chapter, where uh, Jesus says, I've come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. It's his call to people not to remain in the darkness, not to remain part of the empire, but to move and transition their lives to become part of the kingdom, to move from darkness to light. That's, of course, repentance. That's what repentance is, is that process right there. So the reason to celebrate the nativity of Jesus at Christmas in Jesus' own words, why did Jesus come into the world? In Jesus' own words, I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. That's what Christmas is actually about, according to Jesus. 
Presumably he should know. He's going to come into the world. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. And the reason he's coming into the world, according to uh, the reports of the Gospel of John, is so that everybody who believes in me, which we've talked about a lot, right, believes in me, could be trusts in me, has allegiance to me, all of those would be good renderings of that. Everyone who comes along with me, all of those things don't remain in the darkness. It's Jesus' great call to move from kingdom to, from um, empire to kingdom, to remain in the kingdom or to move from the empire into the kingdom. That's what he's calling us to do. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. It's a really important message. If you, if you were here this morning, you saw or you would have seen um, a huge mob of little children act out uh, the nativity here. Some of them, we have a couple back there who were part of this, which was really great. Um, and of course, for kids at Christmas, the birth of Jesus is a, is a cool thing to talk about and enact and live out. And somewhere, as we, as we age and we grow up, I think it's time that we, we move towards the same sort of understanding of what's going on at Christmas that Jesus had. It's kind of like the grown-up Christmas. And the grown-up Christmas is that Jesus came as light into the world so that everyone who believes in him, trusts in him, shows allegiance to him, won't remain in the darkness. That's what that's actually about. Now, if you're going to do that and move away from the darkness, um, then Christmas for grown-ups is decision time. It's decision time because the kingdom has come and is coming and you can't choose both empire and kingdom. So that's not an option. You can't choose both things. And the coming of Christmas in the grown-up version of Christmas says, here's my great gift to you. I'm going to give you access to the kingdom, says Jesus. But you're going to have to choose. That's your Christmas present this year choose says Jesus and remember in the famous words of his namesake from the Old Testament that same Joshua that Yeshua who came across the river what did he have to say about this choose this day whom you will serve as for me and my me and my household we will serve the Lord so brothers and sisters